We ask it all in Jesus' name. Lord, if there's one today who uh, needs a touch in their body, I ask the Lord that you reach and touch them today, right now. I ask, Lord, if there's one whose heart uh, that would be watching this video, whose heart is far from you, I pray that you'll reach and let them feel your invitation, your bidding, your summons to the very throne of God. Lord, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Well, I'm glad to be with you once again. And last week, uh, we continued our study. Folks, we're using kind of as a, um, a guideline this article uh, entitled The God-Man that was written uh, a very long time ago. It was written in the uh, early 1800s. And it was written by a Baptist man who, who put this out as a, uh, as a tract. Hello, Michelle. It is so good to see you. I've missed you. I'm glad that you're here. I hope you still have uh, the article on the, the God man. We're going to go further in that this week than what we have up to this point. And uh, uh, enjoy this study about who Jesus really is. I... Um, um, I, I have really been enjoying this study. If you don't have the article I was just talking about, uh, I'll be glad to forward it to you. It's not anything new. It's something that, again, was written back in the early 1800s and put forth as a, a tract by a, a Baptist uh, organization. And uh, this is a man who had no access to grind. He just... Um, saw the revelation of who Jesus is and he wrote about it and it has come to us today and it, it's just great. I'll be glad to provide that to you if I can have your email address and, uh, um, and I'll be glad to share it with you. Certainly it doesn't cost me anything. I wouldn't charge you a, a thing for this. So if you'd like to have it, let me know. The, uh, we've gotten through uh, parts one two, and three. Today we're going to look at uh, part four, and uh, I don't really want to go back to do much of a review because I'll get sidetracked. <laughs> I enjoyed those first three parts so much. Uh, again, if you don't have that, um, if you don't have that, uh, that tract or that, that article, that paper, let me know. I'll get it to you. Uh, and um, uh, the other videos that we have, parts one, two, and three, will catch you up anytime you have the time to look on them. They're both on Pastor's Letters. You'll also find them on YouTube on the Pastoral Letters page that I maintain there. That will have uh, quite a number of my videos that are there, sermons that I've preached, my Sunday morning messages that I've preached. This past Sunday I preached about the heavy load of love and for uh, of our Mother's Day uh, message and uh, I so enjoyed ministering that and it touched my heart and I hope that it uh, will, will touch you as well it's certainly well I think it's well worth the time to hear from the Word of God now let's look here on uh, uh, topic four of this of this paper it says Jesus asserted his full possession of the power to forgive sins. We're talking about the claims that Jesus made of his own deity. He knew he, who he was. He didn't play coy about knowing he was the Messiah. He was the anointed one. He, the Christ, he didn't, uh, he didn't try to hide things from people. He revealed things to people. And that's what he's, he, he did when he uh, uh, made it clear that he had full possession of the power to forgive sins. Uh, the moral instincts of the Jews were correct when they put the question, who can forgive sins but God only? Let's look in the second chapter of the book of Mark and see the, uh, uh, the context of this. <clears throat>
Let's look in the second chapter. Let's go back. Uh, to the very first verse and work our way down. Mark chapter 2, And again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and was noised that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them, no, not so much as about the door, and he preached the word unto them. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when he could not come nigh unto him, unto Jesus, for the press, they uncovered the roof where he, where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this, this man speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit, they so reasoned within themselves. He said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? For it is easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise, and take up thy bed, and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose, and took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch they were all amazed, and glorified God, saying, we never saw it on this fashion. Jesus not only said, I can forgive sins and made the proclamation, but when there was doubt, he said, what's easier? Say your sins be forgiven you or to say take your bed and walk. So you'll know that I can forgive sins. Son, take up your bed and walk. He not only made a proclamation of his own deity and power, that he was in fact God revealed in flesh, but he showed it. He took command over the affliction of that man and gave him complete liberty, not just over his sins, but over his frailty as well. My goodness, what a God we serve. We do not wonder that with their ideas of Christ, they asked in amazement, who is this that forgiveth sins also? Um, look at Luke 7, 49. Of course, we saw that here in Mark also. This is a different occurrence, a different setting. And I want to read this setting also. Uh, it's, I think it's important that we see some context with all this. And one, uh, verse 36 of Luke chapter 7. One of the Pharisees desired him, desired him that he would eat with them. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. Behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, and stood at his feet behind him weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, 
and anointed them with the anoint with the ointment. Now, when the Pharisees, which had bidden uh, him, uh, saw it, he spake within himself, saying, "This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that touches him, for she is a sinner." Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. He saith, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors, and the one owed five hundred pence and the other fifty. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose, that he to whom he forgave most. He said to him, Thou hast uh, rightly judged. He turned to the woman and said to her, I uh, said to Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with, an, with ointment. Wherefore, I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. He said to her, Your sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? He said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. It was hard for people to break their traditions and their own, their old ways of thinking. But Jesus wasn't bound by other people's ways of thinking. He was Almighty God. He could, uh, he could make. He made the rules. He could adjust them if he wanted to. He's God. He, he didn't know uh, an explanation to anybody. This woman came with the right attitude. Folks, you can't come to God for forgiveness unless you have the right attitude. This woman came with humility, offering all that she had, that ointment, which uh, is thought to be of, of great value. She gave that. She was so sincere and wept so uh, heavily that she was able to wash the Savior's feet with her tears and then used her hair to dry his feet. What a beautiful picture of a heart that's reaching out to God. And yet, these other guys who are so self-righteous, what in the world's going on here? If he was really a prophet, he'd know what kind of woman this is. Well, Jesus knew, knew exactly who she was. And he forgave her. He knows there's nothing in this where he looked at Simon and said, Simon, your sin's forgiven you. None of that. He forgave the one who came wanting forgiveness. It's no wonder that, that uh, 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 those who saw this, they were so unaccustomed to anyone claiming to have power over sin that they, uh, they wondered, who is this man that blasphemes? And yet he didn't blaspheme because he, fact, he in fact had the power to do what he said he was going to do. And yet Christ declared most emphatically on more than one occasion his possession of this divine prerogative. He healed the palsied man and professed attestation of the fact. Those 
who would uh, eliminate the miraculous element from the second narrative altogether must admit that Matthew, Mark, and Luke all relate most uh, circumstantially that Jesus did at least profess to work a miracle and support his claim to possess power to forgive sins. If he wrought the miracle, his claim is established. If he did not work it, but cheated the people, then away with him. Forever as, a, uh, as an errant imposter. And no one can forgive sins but God only. Everybody was clear on that, and it was true. Could a mere man cancel with a word the sin of a creature against his maker? The very thought is a blasphemy. Only if Jesus was divine. That's the only way he could do such a thing. A man can't do that. We might say God's going to forgive you, but Jesus forgave it. My goodness. All right, that's section four. Let's look at section five. Jesus claimed the power to raise his own body from the grave, to quicken the souls of men into spiritual life, and to raise all the dead in the last great day. Now that's quite a claim. Anybody who came to me today and made that claim, any man, I don't care how smart, how wise, uh, what kind of reputation they might have, to tell me that they were going to be able to, they were the Lord of the resurrection as Jesus did, I'm going to not believe them. I won't accept it. Of course, I accept Jesus. And I know that he is the only way to life. Jesus likened his body to a temple which the Jews should destroy and which he would raise up again in three days. Let's look at John, the second chapter, where he made that claim. Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and will you it up in three days but he spake of the temple of his body Jesus uh, had power over life and death he affirmed that he had power to lay down his life and the power to take it up again let's look in John 10 and I want to read more than just this one verse that's referred to here in the article I want to go back uh, and actually get some um, gets, I, I want to see what this is saying to us um, starting in verse 7 then Jesus then said Jesus unto them again verily verily I say unto you which is truly truly I say to you I am the door of the sheep all that ever came before are, uh, before me are thieves and robbers but the sheep did not hear them I am the door by me if any man enter in he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy I am come that they might have life they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Now wait just a minute. You, you're saying you're the way. You're saying you're the door. Nobody else but you. And now you say you're going to die? More than they said he was going to give up his life who gives his life for the sheep. He that is a hireling and not the shepherd, whose own uh, the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth, and the wolf catches them and scatters the sheep. 
the hireling fleeth because he is a hireling and, uh, and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father. I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall uh, hear my voice, and there shall be one fold, and one shepherd. Therefore hath my Father, therefore doth my Father love me, because I laid down my life that I might take it again. Now there's some radical new theology. Not only laid down his own life, but the power to take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my father. Jesus said, no one's going to take my life from me. I give it up. And then I'll reach and I'll take it again. Who can do that but God himself? Think about Jesus on the cross. I've got a book here that is entitled The Murder of Jesus Christ. And it's a good book and it recounts a lot of the history and and it lightens a good bit, but I, I have a problem with the title of it. They conspired to murder Jesus, but they didn't do it. He gave up his life. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And he gave up the ghost. He suffered brutally. It was awful what Jesus paid for my sins. The chastisement of my peace was upon him. My goodness. It's by his stripes that we're healed. It was a terrible price. But when it came down to it, they could not extinguish his life. He yielded it up. He gave up the ghost. Otherwise, he would never he would not have died. He laid down his life. Jesus did. But as, as God revealed in flesh, God cannot die. It was the Son of God, the man Christ Jesus, that tasted of death. And through that, the incarnation, God himself knows what death is all about. He understands it. But the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Jesus, the arm of God didn't leave Jesus to suffer corruption, but took his life back and arose. <laughs> and he reigns today and forevermore. Praise God. That's the whole heart of our Christian message and of our faith. We believe that Jesus is alive. Yes, in fact, he did die. He gave up his life. Why? He did it for the sheep. He did it for you. He did it for me. He didn't die because uh, some people who were politically, politically motivated, extremely harsh, just because they want him dead. It's a power grab. Jesus wasn't moved by that. He saw the sin of man and knew there was no other way but that the Lamb of God, the Lamb slain from the foundation of the earth, that the Lamb had to die. Jesus, the perfect, spotless, sinless Lamb of God, gave up his life and was in that uh, tomb. And on the third day, the same, the same power that laid down that life took it back again. Otherwise, these words mean nothing. 
Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. It's him. He has the voice that's going to raise us from the dead. Lazarus heard the voice of God. And he came forth from the tomb. I want to tell you, the day is going to come. If I go by way of the grave, that I'll hear his voice right after a shout, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and those of us who are alive and remain shall be caught together with them in the clouds, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. No one can separate us. Who can separate us from the love of God? Not famine, not persecution, not peril of sword. Not coronavirus 19. Nothing can separate me from the love of God. At one point it says, and no other creature. I'm a created being. I can't even separate myself from the love of God. He's there all the time. Oh my, I'm out of time. I'm out of time. But the beauty of who Jesus is, his claims are valid because he actually has uh, substantiated them. He said, I'm going to lay my life down and I'm going to take it back. And that's exactly what he did. You think that bunch of disciples who were so uh, frightened, intimidated, and scattered, do you think they could have changed the world if they hadn't seen a resurrected Jesus? Praise God. The power of his resurrection. Oh, Paul wrote that I might know him in the power of his resurrection and in the fellowship of his sufferings. Oh, to know Jesus, to know him in the highs and know him in the lows, to know him when it's uh, all uh, just a, uh, a bowl of cherries and to know him when there ain't no cherries around. It's just nothing but pain. Sometimes the heavy load of love is what bears us right on. Praise God. Well, I'm not even going to get through all of topic five because my time is up. Lord, thank you for your word and thank you for revealing yourself unto us and help us to be great students hungry for understanding. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open my understanding. Open my heart that I might know you better. Grow in you. To grow in your grace and in your knowledge. Help me, Lord. Lord, I pray you'll bless each one who's going to partake of this study. I ask your hand upon each one. Help them, Lord, to be more assured every day of who you are and of your mighty power. Now go with us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining me and for sticking with me. It's so good to see each of you uh, here with me. We're going to continue next week. Maybe we'll get a little further. Maybe we won't. But we're going to study nonetheless. And I'm so glad to be able to spend this time with you.